What's up, everyone? It is Richie here from the F1 Podcast. Today is Season 3, Episode 15, which will be covering the 2023 Canadian Grand Prix. Today's actually a really special episode. Not only do I have Andrew and Erica here. Hey, guys, how are you doing? Stop, 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 stop. Hey, oh. I also brought some friends that I was at the track with. As you guys know, Tyler Hatherall and Spencer maybe had the honor of coming with me, also Morgan Panabaker had the honor of coming to the race this weekend. And why not bring them on, five of us on a pod, to talk about probably one of the best weekends we've ever had. Hey guys, welcome back. Thank wow, so what an intro. Us. The honor of joining you at the track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny it's how you sorry. use the word oh, honor, yeah. exactly. <laughs> We have a race in Canada and suddenly everyone's a monarchist. What's going Yo, on? To be fair, this guy met British dining royalty on the weekend, so okay, I can well, see why. This is true. This is true. We got some spice on that, and we'll talk about uh, how I was not an idiot sandwich there. <laughs> so just for our listeners, uh, how we're going to do uh, the Canadian Grand Prix is today we're shooting season three, episode 15. We're going to be focusing just solely on the race, and later this week, We'll have season three, episode 16, which we're going to talk about all the fun stuff and all the stories and just the, being the atmosphere in Montreal uh, this past weekend. And we're still buzzing. I just want to first say thank you to all of our fans and everybody that we've met at the track. Uh, we appreciate all the support we got on Instagram, one of our best weekends in terms of social content. Um, but without further ado, let's discuss the Canadian Grand Prix, which Checo set the fastest lap at a minute 14 seconds. And why not have Andrew Cleary do it? Because I didn't want to do it. <laughs> oh, someone's got to count me in. I need the clock. All right. Oh, let me do the honors. Lap was 114.481 set on the final lap by Checo, getting him that additional point to help reduce the championship lead by Max Verstappen. But can we really call it reduction? when he kicks his ass every week. So but. I can't necessarily get all the tenths and milliseconds in there. So we'll do a minute and 14. How does that sound? Sounds good. All righty. Three, two, one, go. Wet qualifying lad Checo, or sorry, it had Max as P1, Alonso as P2, a repeat of the first front row of last year's K Grand Prix with Alex Albon finishing in the top 10 and making it to Q3 as well. So we had a pretty much mixed up grid uh, going into the race. Uh, off the first turn, Max is able to pull forward with uh, the Mercedes of Hamilton going ahead of Alonso in the first turn, but he was able to get him back. Uh, but the Mercedes were fast this weekend. You know, George Russell was having a great race until he clipped the uh, turn. I believe it was in turn five and six. Uh, hits the barrier and thought he was out of the race, but no made it back to the pits and was able to continue on until he had an unfortunate break issue where he then had to DNF. Uh, we had... Uh, you have a promise from uh, Lance Stroll's father that we were going to have two uh, Aston Martins on the podium this weekend. We did not. We only had one. We had Fernando Alonso, but Max Verstappen won another race. Surprise, surprise. He is dominant this season with Lewis Hamilton finishing third. We had some great racing overall, some really fun overtakes. Uh, shout out to Lando Norris for really putting that car on the edge, but unfortunately had a five second penalty would finish him out of the points. And with that, that is the fast slap recap. Nicely done, Andrew. So I think let's just get right into it. Uh, we saw a lot this weekend. Let's talk about how we first got to our seats, getting excited to watch FP1. And then within five to 10 minutes, they red flagged the session because of camera issues. It was something to do with regarding a CCT failure at the venue. And also Pierre Gasly, um, his car couldn't, couldn't go anymore. So... You know, we had that issue going on there. And then also we had a number of the time had to move over to FP2 to cover that. And then also there was more moments that happened and then the rain started coming in. So what stood out for the team this weekend here in Canada, uh, particularly, let's maybe start with the practice sessions. The weather was wild. You know what? As a first spectator, if there's going to be a rain at any sporting event, I think F1 is probably the most exciting. And uh, although we got absolutely poured on, it was a ton of fun and it was good to see that spectrum of f1 to witness what intermediate tires look like what wets i don't think anyone went on full wets at during the the practice but to see it and to see it in real life is, is surreal and so to see that spectrum was a ton of fun i think uh they battled well i think it it, it came into qualifiers as well which i think really showed which teams picked the best strategy we'll we'll be talking about 
what Alex Albon picked, uh, pulled off this weekend, which was incredible. And I think that that goes into a lot of strategy and how they took the rain into play. So um, very eventful for the weather. And, and it was interesting who made the most of it. I like how you use the word fun to describe being absolutely torrential downpoured on. Um, but I think that just shows how great the crowd was because, you know, record crowd of 345,000 over the weekend. But as lots of people were heading to the exits at the first drop of rain, there were also a ton of people who stayed and braved out the rest of that FP2 session, including us, um, which was a ton of fun. And I think it just shows just, you know, the atmosphere at these events is incredible. Uh, the people were fired up and and really excited to see, you know, F1 cars on track, especially in the wet. Um, you know, Valtteri going through that that hairpin, almost taking out Charles Leclerc. Um, it, it looked like a lake out there. So, I mean, it was, it was just a lot of fun. And uh, even though we got more rain on us than I've ever seen in my entire life, um, the vibes were were incredible. So pe people were having a good time out there. Ponchos out as well. So the crowd was very colorful and it was a ton of fun. Uh, one of the big things that we did this year is ensure that we packed our ponchos because we needed them for each, almost each day, except for Sunday. I think it made for a lot of great contact, especially in the hairpin scene. I think it was Fernando Alonso in the last lap of FP2 coming in and, and using those inters and splashing a lot of water. I think that's what makes such a great section. But also, I think one of the big things that I've noticed particularly is even though that maybe it was a mess for FP1 being canceled, we at least got a lot more con uh, stuff to watch for FP2. At least like the FIA was able to put the extra time on. And, you know, for those that stayed and enjoyed it, we got to see some great, like, uh, some great practice from the drivers. Which I got to say, I, I was shocked that the FIA did that because if there's one thing that we know about Formula One and the FIA, it's that they are so rigid and so inflexible and so unwilling to change the rules. Um, I was surprised that they threw an extra half hour on for for the fans and, and obviously the teams and, and the drivers had a, had a say in that because they need that running as well. Uh, it's pretty difficult to take out an entire practice session, but I was not expecting that. So shout out to the Formula One and the FIA for getting that one right and uh, extending the session for for the drivers, but also for the fans who uh, uh, were out there that day, because there are some people who you know may just buy a ticket for practice. Now it's a lot to cut out an entire session. So shout out to Formula One for that. Yeah, you mentioning that there about how it was great for the fans and the folks who bought the ticket. Like we've talked about it before with the new sprint session and some of the new like format they've been proposing for F1. And you know they wanna get rid of some of the, the practice sessions, less data collection, more about the qualifying and the racing. And so I was even shocked just from their like business standpoint of broadcasting and whatnot that they were willing to, to take this approach. So. I mean, in my opinion, if you know it's going to be crummy weather for an entire weekend, I think you really do need that practice time because it's even more about safety, but safety versus the economics is the age old question. So it's, it's definitely nice that they were willing to kind of like acquiesce a little bit there to do what was going to be best for the drivers and for the weekend overall. I think there was a lot of feedback from the drivers saying how bumpy the, the track was as well. And so getting a feel for both dry and wet. And that and seeing how the car reacts in both conditions is is critical for the race prep. So yeah, if you are if you are going to do data collection, I think having all weather is pretty important. If we still did this race in November or toward the end of the season like it used to be, even more data collection for the cold, potentially snowy track. So I like I think that's a good segue because like let's talk about a little bit about qualifying because we kind of saw a little bit of that where some teams took the risk that even the track was wet at times that even some of them went on softs and, and we, you know, look at, we saw like Nico Hulkenberg getting P2 before the penalties. We'll talk about the penalties, but just to see, so I, I just can't believe, I think my biggest takeaway is the risk that some teams did on the, uh, on the softs on a track that looked, did not look dry at all. And it really goes to show the racing line is really important on some of these tracks. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it, it definitely paid off for Alex Albon, which I think he was one of the first to to go out on the slicks um, after the race or after the the racing line started drying up. So yeah, that was great to see. It's fun to see like a team like Williams not hesitate on doing that because they know that they're they've already like maxed out or peaked in Q two getting there. That why not take that risk for Q three? And I wish some of the other drivers, such as like Leclerc, probably should have done that. Lance Stroll should have definitely taken a risk on the softs um, on the track because he those two you know got caught out it was fun watching Alvin drive the softs in a, on a wet track he seemed to really have that grip 
he was able to find the grip on the line and well deserving getting that car into Q3. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the one point that I like that you made there, Andrew, is just Williams didn't overcomplicate their strategy. I think they took what was a very easy gamble and sent Albon out on the softs. And if you contrast that with what Ferrari did and, you know, look at their strategy where they kind of overthought it and were trying to get a banker lap in on the inters before switching to the softs and then they couldn't warm up the tires quick enough and then it started raining again. And, you know, you get in this middle ground where Leclerc is not able to set a lap on the optimal tire. Uh, and, and you know, obviously that that was the demise of his qualifying session because he missed out on, on getting into Q3. But I think it just shows that, you know, sometimes the simplest approach is, is the best when it comes to strategy. And, you know, we've talked about that a lot when it comes to Ferraris that they've been unable to, you know, continually and consistently get that strategy right. Um, you know, we'll get to this later. It looked like they they kind of turned that around in the race, but at least for qualifying, it was it was same old Ferrari. And it's interesting because you may say, well, you know, Williams has nothing to lose, but neither does Ferrari. Ferrari's not in a championship fight this year. They're not even fighting for P2. You so lose. you might, you know, look at that and say, you know, what what is Ferrari doing when it comes to strategy? Um, because Williams got it absolutely perfect. And, and, you know, the Scuderia, not so much. Smooth Oof. bottom car acting like a smooth operator. Oh, speaking of not so smooth operators, can someone tell science to not park the freaking car in the middle of this of the final <laughs> chicane? Uh, let's get ready to rumble. The story of the weekend for qualifying was obviously the word impeding. I've never seen this many <laughs> this many impeding penalties in my life. I think it's well, everyone's Jared first. Gasly did not like that, <laughs> so yeah, that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't fun. And to go at the very end of a straight where he's going at max speed and he's just road blocking, that was uh, that's very dangerous. I I mean, how signs can react, what you see behind you and what you see in front of you. And how you're trying to react and then you just happen to get in someone's way and then you get into uh, a grid penalty for that. I mean, that's, I want to say bad luck, but yeah, just proper reaction. But it's interesting that you mentioned that. It's just, but like you have mirrors and your team should be telling you if somebody's on a hot lap behind you. Like that is some dangerous stuff for the, for that to happen. And like Hulkenberg received a penalty for infringement. Science got for impeding. Lance Stroll got an impeding. Esteban Alcon, Yuki. Uh, for impeding Nico Hulkenberg. Like we talk about like all qualifying kind of like, it was like, you get a penalty and you get a penalty and you get a penalty, but then nothing at the race uh, we, uh, on when it came, came to impeding. So I don't know. I, I found that part of qualifying, just the amount of red flags and just like kind of bonehead moves that teams were doing that cost. Like even Nico, Nico Hulkenberg having that amazing qualifying and it just, his race was, was ruined because of, the stupid penalty. It's like he didn't get a second penalty though in Q3 for another impeding. I get getting off the line, but when you park it in the middle of the track where you obviously need to cross on the chicane, use your head. It's just embarrassing. And you know, I, I if I, I'm surprised Gasly didn't say something afterwards to him because when you're driving at 300 kph down in Q1 and then all of a sudden you can't go right and you got to go left into the wall. Oh, by the way, that screws up your time lap when you could have finished P6. P7 in the session and move on. I think they maybe need to enforce stricter penalties, in my opinion, for impeding. Like three great places is not enough. Maybe five, maybe ten. If you're not on a hot lap, like you said, there's, I feel like just even as someone who's cooling down, if you can, you know to get out of the way. And especially if you're on somewhere like that chicane right by the wall of champions, like it's a pretty notorious spot for stuff to go wrong. I think everyone should kind of be hauling ass to get through there so that it's not going to hold anyone up. Yeah. And, and hopefully this is a lesson for the drivers moving forward, because I think it's only going to get worse. Like we're going to some tracks coming up. Austria is next, which is the Monza. shortest track on the calendar. So Monza is notoriously horrible for cars queuing at the end of sector three to get a hot lap going. So I think if the drivers don't get their act together, it's going to become a mess because we have, you know, Austria again, which is the shortest track on the calendar. 20 cars in Q1 on that track is going to be disaster. So, you know, I I, I agree, Andrew. I think harsher penalties are, are needed. Even in that session, Carlos had multiple uh, moments where he impeded somebody. He only got one three-place grid penalty. I, in my opinion, that's not enough of a deterrent to stop guys from, from doing that. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they police it going forward because that was certainly 
one of the the driving topics of, of quality this weekend. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's some good points, Tyler. And I think you know, let's segue right into the race now. Let's before even the race even started. I think I don't know if we, you guys realize this. Uh, I know Andrew and Erica. I don't know if you watch this, but the drivers' parade was delayed. So normally, the drivers' parade would have all the drivers go out together, but I posted on YouTube like the most awkward kind of edit video because at one point only seven drivers went out and then five minutes later three drivers went out and then so it was not really in like an in sync uh compared to last year but apparently a, a number of drivers got uh fined because they showed up late for the driver's parade uh so <laughs> and i don't know if that to do with montreal traffic or what or whatnot but yeah there was just like this awkward moment where you would see drivers go by and then nothing for like five minutes and then i did not Kevin hear Magnuson said that the traffic was so bad that he left his car on the street and had oh. to go onto the track. So wow. I th- oh it sounds goodness. like it was Montreal traffic, and he he was fine. You're right; he got a reprimand for it. So it was just so funny because we saw all these drivers come by, and then there was nobody for five to ten minutes, and then here comes Nico and and K Mag at the at the back all by themselves. So one uh, Nick uh, Devries is, did not have a flag on his car, so nobody knew who he was. <laughs> if you're looking from far or distance unless you're in front and then number two uh because well, he was in the stands i was gonna say it was just this guy <laughs> I'm talking to him right now he was in the stands You're talking to him right Come now on. he's probably holding up a mirror to himself being like hey oh i don't know how to do it do- it's me dutch accent man i don't know how to do it I'll take um, it. I'll I'll run with it. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then also uh Pierre Gasly giving shade to Carlos Sainz for impeding him again in the driver's parade. He's just like, oh, you know, Carlos is impeding me once again. You give him another three grid penalty. Yeah, we had a, like an interesting race, I think. I mean, you know, Max Verstappen wins yet again. But, but he only won by 10 seconds this time. But Not John, again. Tyler, and Spencer, you can say you were at a race where history was made because that was Red Bull's 100th win as a constructor. I think the history was really Ferrari getting its strategy right. I think, uh, <laughs> I think that was more important to, to Ricci and I. <laughs> well, that was dicey. Let's be real. When the safety car came out, both the Ferrari stayed out uh, on their medium uh, compound tires. And I was just like, Oh my goodness, this is what's gonna happen. We're gonna get it towards the midpoint of the track. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to change our tires and then we're gonna lose grid grid position. But it worked. And apparently, according to Red Bulls, Helmut Marco said apparently the Ferrari was one of the more faster cars on the track uh today. And even Sergio Perez could even keep up. But I think uh before we get into that, Andrew, I think you had a trivia question for uh for Mr. Red Bull over here. You wanna see if he can answer it? Yeah, so we're oh, going to do a little no. Red Bull by the numbers here, Tyler, because... Oh, I, I didn't win, study for this. With <laughs> I wish win, I got the Google became, Doc earlier. Here are some quick numbers for Red Bull. Uh, with their 100th win, they become the fifth constructor to reach the century win mark in all of F1 history. Uh, 52 of their 100 wins have been from the pole position, where 26 of the wins have also resulted in a 1-2 finish for the team, which is pretty impressive as well as that they've won at 30 different circuits over five continents. Now, Tyler, being the Red Bull fan that you are, can you name all five Red Bull drivers who have won a Grand Prix and also order them from most wins to least wins? Ooh. And do you know Ooh. the full, Do you know their numbers as well? Do you know how many wins each one has? Oh, Lord. <sighs> okay, so I can get... I would have gotten the drivers, but the order is going to be tough. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. Okay, okay. so Max. So let's go. Let's go with who who has the most wins under Red Bull. Yeah, so Max Verstappen has the most wins at Red Bull Racing. He's How the goat. That's have? an easy one. He is forty one, tying for- Ayrton Senna uh, for the all time list at number five. Uh, so that was pretty impressive. Number two, Sebastian Vettel, thirty seven all time wins. 38 all-time wins. Oh, you so close. That's good. No, it's close. Very close. I know, I know Checo's last. So third mm-hmm. has got to be Danny Rick or Mark Weber. Oh, it's so tough. I feel like they're close. I'm going to say Ricardo third with seven. Mark Weber with six. And then Checo has, Checo has won twice this year, twice last year, I think. None in 21. No, he won in 21. I think he only won one time last year, right? 
Last year he won. He won in Baku in twenty one. Last mm-hmm. year he won in Monaco. And this one more. Year he, he won, won twice. He won one more so, last year. So I think he won Sing- Singapore last year. Singapore last year. So he's got five then. Yeah. So you are very okay. close. There you go. You're very close. Uh, you have the first two right. Then you have Mark Weber is actually third with nine wins. Danny oh, Rick wow. has seven. You're correct. And the Checo has five. So very good job, Tyler. Very good okay, job. Okay, close enough. Close Impressive enough. stuff. Now, can what? you tell us where Red Bull's most successful track has been with seven wins? I'm going to guess here because I, I don't know, admittedly. But they've always historically been really strong in two places. Mexico is one because of the altitude with those Honda engines. and Austria, the Red Bull Ring. They've always dominated the Red Bull Ring. So I'm going to go because of Red Bull with Hack. I'll say Red Bull Ring. If it's Monza, I'm leaving the chat. It's not Red Bull Ring. It's also not Mexico. Ooh. Oh, it really? is the street circuit of Monaco. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. They well, yeah, seven... Sad, Danny Rick. Mm-hmm. Danny okay. Rick had one. Vax has had two wins now at the Principality. I believe or yeah. one. Or just one. No, he's got two. He won in and, 21 and this mm-hmm. year. Right. And then Checo has one. Mm-hmm. I believe Weber has one there as well. And then Vettel too. As well wow. As well so, yeah. Wow. I would not have guessed Monaco. That is, that's crazy. But they're pretty good. Like the thing that you won at 30 different circuits, right? Over five continents. That just shows to show how impressive that is, in my opinion, being able to win at multiple circuits throughout the season. So, Congratulations to Red Bull, who I think have won like 18 of the last 19 races now oh, on the F1 calendar. Um, the one being a Ferrari W, no, a Mercedes W. What, what am I saying? A Mercedes Brazil, W in yeah. Brazil. So Ferrari have been shut out the last 19 races. Oh my goodness. You, I just keep, it, it's just like when you go to a track to actually watch Max Verstappen race, it's like the amount of the gap that he can, he produces is like ridiculous. In a single lap, the amount of space he's able to put between himself and the next car. Like if you, and and that was it. Like we wa- we watched this last year. I'm sure you guys saw the same thing this year. Like everyone's a little bit closer together at the start. And then by like four laps into the race, Max has five seconds on everyone else. And it's just kind of out for a nice little Sunday drive from that point onward. <laughs> it's incredible. And I'm pretty sure he was lapping close to the midfield near the end of the race. So this guy was doing damage on the track. So, yeah, it's incredible to see. But you're right, Erica, seeing that gap in person where he drives by and then you just patiently wait for second and third to come by. And it's like, unless there's a safety car, there's no possible way someone can catch up to that. Um, So, yeah, it's pretty wild uh, how quickly he can create that gap. I think the bigger question is that we're going to see this year. And, you know, I've already listened to a couple of people talk about it after the, their post Canadian Grand Prix podcast is who's going to be that number two driver. And so we saw impressive drives for Fernando Alonso this weekend, Lewis Hamilton. Again, I think honestly, one of the most goats uh, podiums, I think anybody will ever see all F1 champions and Tyler and Spencer, like we got to see that. That's pretty cool. Sergio Perez is at 126 points, Fernando Alonso, 117, and Lewis Hamilton at 102. And like, I think technically, if you remove Max out of the picture, I think Fernando Alonso might lead by one point. He would. Yeah, he would lead the championship, which is wild. I love that, though. That makes me so excited for him. Although it did break my heart when on the broadcast, they're talking about Lewis and Alonso duking it out toward the end of the race, and they refer to them as the old masters. (laughs) <laughs> like oh that hurts that hurts so, so john tyler and spencer i have i have a question because you guys were there you were able to witness i'm in this little conundrum right now with aston martin i can't tell if, Ch- if if fernando alonso is driving p2 with the seventh fastest car on the grid or if lance stroll is absolutely just cheeks when it comes to racing around a track i want to think it's the latter because it looks like they have a fast car and Alonso's been able to maximize it out. But I honestly cannot tell, which is just honestly becomes so frustrating when Daddy Stroll says, oh, we're going to get a double podium this weekend because it's our home GP. And his son absolutely just chokes the bag completely in qualifying, takes a penalty, is P16, and he's just 
tough to get a point out of it at least and then you know thankfully for Lando's quote unquote unsportsmanlike penalty he was able to get to P9 but I don't I can't tell like where are we at right now what do you think with Aston Martin like I'm in this conundrum I think it's a little bit of both I think uh Alonso's experience really shows that guy pushes that car to the very max um and then Stroll I think he he does lack that that skill that experience in F1 it's an uphill battle for him right he's always got something to prove with his dad being the owner of the team but when you see it in person and and say you are watching the onboard cameras and and us witnessing the hairpin turn watching Alonso hit a perfect racing line downshift perfectly hit the apex and start accelerating coming right back out and then you see Stroll knock into Hamilton and qualifying and it's like there's a huge difference here in the level of experience and how well they can push that car. A little bit of both. I think one of the big things is for Lance Stroll, particularly, he's not had a good car all of his career. It's debatable. That's not true. <laughs> what what if, that, that, that racing point in 2020 was an absolute yeah. rocket ship. You rocket lose. ship. It won a race. Checo won on, on merit, on pace. But I think Lance, there's no excuse for Stroll. But Lance did it. I really do. Exactly. So, so, exactly. so the question, the question is like, so now he's in a car that he is meant to compete in, but he's not living up to the, we've been talking about this for multiple episodes, not living up to the expectation that Fernando Alonso is. So at one point, like the team needs to make a decision on their second driver and like, you know, mid the mid, the, we have, we'll be doing a grading segment as an, as a pod at the midpoint season. So like the team needs to decide if like they want to go farther in the constructors and, you know, been able to be able to compete with Mercedes, it's like they need to figure out that second seat. Sorry, I'm going to yeah. be honest about that. And if you think about it, like he joined Formula One in 2017. He's had six years of racing. There are people who don't get the opportunity to race in a better car and don't make it this long in the sport before they're replaced in a seat. And then just to throw my take on it, you see, this is really the downs. No one tells you about the downsides of nepotism. You know, we always, we always talk about how nepotism is great for people's careers, but like, it really sucks when you have to fire a family member. And that's where I think Lawrence Stroll is headed later this year. Well, Erica, I Can you imagine mention- this conversation? Yeah. You're sitting around the dinner table and it's like, how's work going? Um, it's going fine for me. It will not continue for you though, son. <laughs> <laughs> See, Erica, I did, I, I uh, wrote um, on, on Instagram to the IGA F1 podcast. They had a post. Uh, about the qualification i literally told them i said lance stroll is going to be the reason why aston martin do not finish ahead of mercedes and the constructors this year and it's quite clearly evident based on this week's race i know that he finished p6 one position ahead of um alonso in spain but we forget that alonso had no floor yeah <laughs> legit had no car and then no floor is where all the downforce is being generated and he still finished one position behind him <laughs> So at exactly. what point yeah. do you what point do you say you're not on the team anymore? We're we're past that point, I think. And the, the question isn't should he lose his seat. The question is will Lawrence kick his own son out of the team? And I think the answer is I don't know. None of us know. <laughs> I think I guess I think there's a big... Lance will have a seat forever. But go ahead, Spencer. I don't I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. It's 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 boggling. I think if we've heard. If we've heard from Lawrence Stroll on how he approaches that, everything is a business decision for him. And he's a huge advocate for what the stock price is doing, what the the street Aston Martins are selling for. And so if he can create kind of a big enough story replacing Lance Stroll with a better driver that increases the stock price of Aston Martin by 25%, I feel like he'd do that. So not to say, not to say he would sell... Uh, sell out his own son for the the growth of the company. But if you are running a F1 team that wants to compete with Mercedes, you got to make a business decision at the end of the day. So it's oh. funny that you mentioned that because I was actually talking to my dad about this uh, on Sunday where he was saying, you know, he owns Aston Martin as a brand, like not just as it pertains to Formula One. So is there a potential for him to take Lance out of F1, but create a different racing offshoot in which he can put him in? Like, can you imagine like former Formula One driver, Lance Stroll heads new Aston Martin racing, like 
in some type of, you know, kind of series where you've got maybe like a standard kit that you're working with and you're just adjusting a car versus, you know, Formula One where there's a little bit more tinkering to it. So yeah, Formula One. <laughs> so put, a, put them so in the Formula lose your, You lose your F1 seat, but you can be a general manager at an Aston Martin dealership. <laughs> <laughs> you lose. You can sell cars in Ajax, Ontario if you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eric, you make up a really good point. Maybe if there's an opportunity to shoot off a F, a Formula E opportunity or team, maybe that's something that Lawrence can, or Lance, Lawrence can take a look at for Lance down the road is put him in F, in Formula E. Look what look what happened to look what happened to Gio. Like he won the Le Mans. Yeah. Um, but so let's talk about jobs security here. Uh, let's talk about Williams. An amazing weekend for Alex Albon. Probably had one of the drives of the season and was able to put the car in points and, you know, able to get them up a little bit in the constructors. However, his teammate didn't fare that well. And, um, you know, with some promise early on in the season, it's looking pretty dire for Logan Sargent in that second driver's seat for Williams. You know, he had an oil week, uh, oil leak in the race. And also, um, I think he was having some issues during, um, during practice, but like credible drive for, uh, for Alex Albon for the mo- motivational uh, going into Austria, but uh, I feel I feel for Logan right now. I think uh, his days might be numbered, and the rumors of maybe Mick Schumacher going into that seat, or then the questions is is Daniel Ricardo looking for another avenue to drive? We've heard this this week. Just wanted to get the pods take uh, on probably like the last point of of uh, Canada Grand Prix, unless unlucky weekend for for Logan with the car breakdown. That's unfortunate, but. I'm looking at the standings and I'm looking at a big fat zero for points on the board. So going to need more than just luck. Um, there's nothing to show for it. I, I think his seat is in jeopardy. Absolutely. I think at the beginning of the season, I probably would have said there's nothing he could do to lose his seat. But the more I'm thinking about it, um, you know, the marketing opportunities of having an American and F1 drive for your team just really aren't there. Because if you think about the American culture, it's all about winning. They're not going to support a guy who's trundling along in P18, fighting for a position that ultimately doesn't matter. When we go to Coda, when we go to Vegas later this season, it'll be interesting to see. But my guess is you're not going to see people walking around in Logan Sargent t-shirts. It's going to be Red Bull. It's going to be Mercedes. It's going to be the teams at the top because Americans like winning. So I, I do think his seat is in jeopardy. And I think to Richie's point, it sounds like there's some rumors out there that Mick Schumacher may be driving for Williams next year. There's the Mercedes connection with Williams. Obviously, they supply engines. James Vowles is also the uh, new team principal there, who is obviously ex-Mercedes. So I think there's an obvious link there between the Mercedes reserve driver and, and Williams, and I think Sargent is creating the opportunity for Mick to potentially get back into Formula One. That would be I interesting also... to see. Yeah, go ahead, Erica. Oh, that was it. That was my only comment. <laughs> oh, I was just, I was just saying that. <laughs> but as it, it to me, it also depends on who's pumping money into the team, right? The Rilton Ventures, they're American, they're American based, and they wanted an American F1 driver on you know, on the lineup this year in Williams to help support that. But when they're just put at what point, how much cash are you going to put into this, you know, cash cow effectively to really rebuild. And I think at, at the point that the Rilton sells, uh, absolutely. Logan Sargent will unfortunately not be an F1 because there's no point in having, the, they don't need that American driver to be in it. Um, but I don't know if the Rilton would want to make that move to not have that American in the seat when that was kind of a major key factor for them, you know, putting more money into this team this year. So I, I, I'm really interested to see. I could definitely see Mick going to Williams. Um, I think it would be a great restart for him, being in the, especially in that Mercedes area. But uh, the only time, to me, the only time we'll tell it all dep- big depends on ownership too. I, that Those are good points, Andrew. Just, I'll just address a couple other drivers that, um, that you just want to be notable. Uh, you know, George Russell had a tough weekend, you know, with the, the brakes issue and having to DNF. He was able to battle back after I think there was an incident on the first lap, um, you know, he went from P 20th to back into the points. I think it was P six. And then he had to cut out at uh, lap 53. Uh, Yuki Sonoda. I, I don't know about you guys in our section. Every time he, he went by uh, people's, I never seen so much clapping in my life for somebody in a P 20 spot uh, at times, but he was, uh, 
that was really interesting to see. Neek didn't have a good weekend. Kevin did not have a good weekend. Um, but yeah, I think, and also, you know, McLaren, there was potential, but got, I think got screwed over by some penalties and oh. another, another race out of the points. So, Such a beautiful drive from Lando only to have a brief glimmer of hope. Like the guy passed on the outside on the hairpin. That's insane. <laughs> I was going to say, obviously I'm biased because I was sitting at the hairpin, but I think Lando had the most entertaining drive of any driver on the grid, bar none. And then unsportsmanlike. Oh yeah, but he's not sportsmanlike, so I can't. Which is it. such a vague <laughs> penalty, right? You know, it, there, there were usually the, I would find FIA being more direct in terms of the definition of why they'd have the five second penalty, but unsportsmanlike behavior. Um, don't ask Ted Kravitz about it though, because he was absolutely <laughs> flabbergasted on the Sky Sports uh, broadcast. But yeah, he, he had such a great drive, and again, another penalty implement issued by FIAs this season where they take away a great race, like the result of a great race from a driver, you know, signs in Australia, Norris here, I think Sonoda too, um, in Barcelona, these guys had tremendous races that just get, you know, suckered out by the five second penalty. Yeah. I think that, that, that's very clear, Andrew. And I think, um, I think those are just some key points. And I think, you know, honestly, you know, kudos to everybody here. I think that was a really good episode and just our take on Canadian Grand Prix. Look, got a little spicy at times and, you know, oh, what's up, Erica? I was just going to say, I love having five people here and it's quite fitting that this is the Canadian Grand Prix recovering because this was the most Canadian way to handle a podcast with a lot of people trying to speak over each other where everyone's just like, <laughs> oh, sorry, you go ahead. No, it's okay. You go ahead. That does not happen. <laughs> elsewhere in the world this is like peak canadian sportsmanship as we're trying to put together a podcast <laughs> do a barrel roll uh, i could not ask for a better uh, co-host and, and guests um so we're gonna wrap up uh season three episode 15 of the canadian grand prix review however we are going to be doing a special episode so make sure you tune in later this week uh where the five of us are going to talk about our experience at the f uh, at montreal this weekend uh, particularly, we got some good stories. We met some celebrities. Uh, we got some funny stories and just, you know, as I said earlier. So let's just leave it at that. So, Andrew, would you want to do the honors and end this episode uh, and get us into the next one? Yes, for sure. Again, everyone, thank you so much for listening to Season 3, Episode 15 of the F1 Podcast. Uh, my name is Andrew Clear, along with my co-hosts, Jonathan Ricci and Erica Hollingsworth. Tyler and Spencer, thank you so much for joining this episode. And we look forward to continuing on our conversation um, in episode 16, where we're going to talk about the fun parts of the weekend and um, everyone's experiences at the track. So stay tuned for more great F1 content. Thank you all and have a great day. Ah. <laughs>